Okay, we're on television. Now, if Hebrews is running into the next kind of a section, and we've been we've been pitter pattering around this section, but I think my personal opinion is if you can understand or fully comprehend eleven and twelve, you probably this is probably one of the greatest cultural expressions in Hebrew, probably in the New Testament, in my personal opinion. And so I have the word, and I was talking about it last week, or the week before last, whenever we were last meeting. This word, let me see. I got, you know, the blacks are wonderful, but sometimes the blues are not as good. M-A-K or C R O T H. E M I A S Macro <coughs> Macro let's put a, a U there instead of an E. Macro because that's Upsilon. Macrothumia. Macrothumia. And of course, like I said, I always give it to you in the form that you'll find it. This is in 12, actually. Um, remember last time we had epithumia. Epithumia, epithumia. Epithumia is a critical word. It's all together. Epipin, right? Thumia. Thumia, if you look at the notes I gave you right here, it says, Thumia, specifically. Um, all right. Uh, from thuos, from thuo, primary verb, to rush, to breathe hard, to blow, to smoke. By implication, to sacrifice, probably by fire. Um, okay, and, and we got to understand that. Uh, by extension, to emulate, slaughter for any purpose, passion. The most important thing to recognize is thumia. Thumia literally, in Greek, means this, this is the scent of the sacrifice. Thumia is the, thumia is the scent of the sacrifice. I got to dispel it. No one believes it, right? No one thinks that that our viewpoint of sacrifice is usually incorrect. They did not take animals and burn them, emulate them, except the Hebrews had a specific sacrifice. Okay, yeah, I'll take time. Remember, there are five sac one, two, three, four, five. Five sacrifices in the Hebrew calendar that are specific. And I need to teach the class again. I haven't taught them for a long time from the Old Testament. The first is the ascension sacrifice. The ascension sacrifice is a Holocaust sacrifice. It is done once a day in the temple. According to Josephus, it was done by the priests, and that was it. The second and third, this is, the, this is a sacrifice for sin and the sacrifice for guilt. If you had sinned unintentionally, unintentionally, Intentional sin you could not sacrifice for, period, done. If you had sinned unintentionally, you could bring a sin sacrifice to God and say, I'm sorry I sinned, I did unintentionally, I want to be forgiven. And they would do a sin sacrifice. The sin sacrifice is kind of ambivalent. We're not exactly sure how they did that. It may have been an immolation sacrifice, but we do know that the priests got the hide on that one. The guilt sacrifice was, I don't know if I've sinned intentionally, or I don't know if I've sinned unintentionally, but just in case, I'm going to bring one in. And so if you came to the temple, you would bring what? The guilt sacrifice. Something, yeah. <laughs> Most of the time people would, okay, how many of you guys are going to stand up and say, I sin, even if it's unintentional. I unintentionally stole, you know, $1,000 from my neighbor. Right? Or I unintentionally did other things that we won't talk about. Okay, then. So, yeah, almost everybody brought a guilt sacrifice. The guilt and sin sacrifice were very similar. They're almost the same kind of thing. The fourth sacrifice was the priest's sacrifice. The priest's sacrifice was um, flour, was meal, with frankincense on top. And the frankincense was burned with the meal, with part of the meal, and the priest got the rest of the meal. <coughs> 
So that's how he got his uh, carbohydrates. The fifth sacrifice is the Thanksgiving sacrifice. All right. The Thanksgiving sacrifice, that's what you came to the temple to do. Because in the Thanksgiving sacrifice, what did you do? You ate it. You ate it. You ate the meat. You ate it. This is, this is the tithe. The Thanksgiving sacrifice is the tithe. You did not bring the tithe and put it into this temple storehouse. That is a total mistranslation of Malachi. Malachi, the, the prophet was telling Malachi, don't bring the, thing, the tithe into the temple and put it in the storehouse. We studied that. It was obvious in the Hebrew. That's what it's saying. The point was, when you went and brought your tithe, what were you doing? Celebrating. You were celebrating, not preemptively, because you actually got it, right? You were celebrating with God the fact that God had blessed you. And so you were taking the tenth, and you were celebrating with God. And by the way, other countries, other religions did not have this. And by the way, what do we do the first thing when we go into a service, the worship service? We have a <coughs> ascension prayer. And then what do we do? Confess. We confess. And then what we do? We have a homily, right, Cup followed by an offering. And who gives the homily? The priest, pastor, right? And then we have the Eucharist. Yes, sir. Who decides if it's intentional or unintentional? Is that are you self-regulated, <laughs> or does somebody else make the determination? <laughs> that is a beautiful question. Okay, this is a this is a problem that Paul addresses in the New Testament in Acts, especially because he's. Remember, and I, and I don't have a list with me. I usually carry the list when I'm teaching this Apollyon documents. This isn't a Apollyon document. Because the Apollyon documents, well, actually not Apollyon documents, the um, uh, Jewish, what's that thing called? There's a, if, if you want to find it, I have a Jewish document. I have, there's an official Jewish guide for how the, about Jewish traditions in life, all right? And in that guide, it lists 31 there are 31 things that if you do not do them, or if you if you miss them, you will be condemned. There is no sacrifice for them. There is no forgiveness for them. Of course, today you have a problem, right? There's no temple. Okay? In the 31, the Big Ten are in there. The Big Ten. One of them happens to be not going to their their six sac their six um, their six festivals right. Three of them are pilgrim festivals. A pilgrim festival means what? You got to be in Jerusalem for the pilgrim festival, right? What happens if you're not there? That's intentional, and there's no forgiveness for it. You're toast. So when Paul went to the people in the diaspora, and the other one is. There's one of them during the, um, what is it, uh, uh, where they blow the horns. That is uh, Rosh Hashanah. Um, well, it's Rosh Hashanah. It's the Jewish New Year, and it's right after the Festival of Booze, because that is a time when you're announcing, what you do is you go to church, you're supposed to, in church, you're supposed to go to the synagogue, and you're supposed to ask forgiveness of the people, anyone that you have t intentionally or unintentionally um cheated or sinned against during the year. That's in Rosh Hashanah, the last day of the Festival of Booze. And on that last day, they they blow the trumpet, the shofar. And guess what? If you don't hear the shofar blow in Jerusalem, that's why I'm 31. You're toast. That's it. There's, there's no hope. You have to do these things or you are not, you cannot have salvation in Jewish thought. There's no way. There's no hope. So what is salvation? That's if most of them question. did not believe in the afterlife or resurrection, what is salvation of the Jewish Well, no, not at this time. At this time, remember, 
We have one, two, three, four, oh, we have five. Oh, that's cool. We have Sadducees, we have Pharisees, we have Essenes, we have Zealots, and we have Teen Hodos. Teen Hodos. Okay, and of this group, when you're saying at this time, the time of when the Hebrews was written, or which time are we? From that's a great question. These guys did not exist in this form during the Old Testament era at all. We're talking from about, and, and this is a best guess, okay? We're talking from about 250 BC. Because that's the apocryphal period that we ignore. Although I've taught the class in the Apocrypha, you know, we, and by the way, for, I'll, I got to remind you of this, for 1,500 years, the Apocrypha was in every Bible written. Every Bible that was published, written, or made, it was in every Jewish Bible, every Gutenberg Bible, every King James Bible, had the Apocrypha until the Reformation. And after the Reformation, they still had it until mm, 18, 1826. 1826, I think is correct. 18, in 1826 AD, the British version. that's when the British Common Bible Society said we will no longer print the Apocrypha because of the cost, because the Bibles are cheap, <coughs> and they don't need it because Martin Luther said, didn't like it. Martin Luther didn't like it, and he made a mistake. He also didn't like, uh, I have to remind you, Hebrews, James, Jude, Second Peter, and Revelation. He didn't like those either. He put those in a apocryphal section in the New Testament, by the way, just so you know. In any case, um, these were these came into being in the inner, in that internecine period of the apocryphal era. And the reason they came into being, okay, Sadducees were the priests. These are the Levites and pre priests. Levites and priests. And they are the ones who did not believe in the resurrection. They believed you went to Gehenna. They also did not accept the, they didn't, ex they only had the Torah. They didn't accept the Mishnah or the Talmudic documents, okay? They did not accept some of the Tanakh, too. The Tanakh is the Old Testament general documents. They were being superseded because, what, who were the Pharisees? Synagogue. Pharisees are the head, heads of the synagogue. The heads of the synagogue. They were the rabbis. rabbis. Yes, these are the rabbis. Rabbis and the teachers, right? They're the teachers. They taught everything. The, they were. These are the guys. Remember, I told you what went on in the temple. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Any teaching? No. Wasn't supposed to be any teaching in the temple. Temple was not the place for teaching. The temple, as far as we know, didn't have a library or documents or anything. Where were all the books? They were in the synagogues. The synagogues had them. And this was caused by what? What caused the Pharisees to come into being? Back to the history of Israel. The history of Israel. Remember, we had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. What happened in the northern kingdom? Got taken over by the Assyrians. The Assyrians. The Assyrians took them, and you know what? We don't really know what happened to them. Uh, the Assyrians were the kind of group, what they would do is they would, uh, they would take everybody, and this was, the, this was kind of the way you did it. You killed them or you took them all, okay? So who's left? We don't know. We have no idea. Whoever is left came out. They eventually... Whatever. What happened to the southern kingdom? Got taken over by leaders. And in that time, yeah, they took the leaders. They didn't take all the people for slaves because that was the Assyrian problem. Okay, just so you know, I, I hate to go through all this history. This is kind of history stuff that your history teachers, I think, should have taught you all when you're in grade school because this is like the big deal about history. The Assyrians would take slaves, and for generations, when you conquered people, you'd take everybody as slaves, and you enslaved everybody. But that proved to be a bad idea. Why? Nobody was left behind. Huh? Nobody was left behind. Well, 
you would eventually move all your people into their land and you would take over. So just like the Assyrians, remember going to Nineveh, right? And that's where, where uh, Jonah, Jonah went up to Nineveh and there were Assyrians all through the land and that was a problem. You, you self-populate. The problem is, though, when you bring in a lot of slaves, you dilute your population, right? And you have problems with, with bringing people into that population with, because you have all these different slaves. And guess what? They don't, they get irritated after a while. And then you have anarchy. Maybe not slave rebellions, but you have anarchy, you have problems, your society gets washed out. And that's why I'm the Assyrians. Um, generally, the earlier days, they would just kill off everybody. Decimation. That's what was supposed to happen, right, according to the Old Testament in the, you're supposed to kill them all, right? And that way you possess the land, you take it, and you don't have any problems, which was an early stage. The next stage, and by the way, the Greeks figured out the problem. What did they do? They, for their slaves, they killed the men. They kept very few men slaves, mostly female slaves. You have less problems with assimilation, but more problems with dilution. So you have to make laws and rules or other issues you have. But that was a problem the Greeks had actually didn't hurt their society too much, and the Romans also. But in this period, the next period was the Babylonian period. Babylon took the leaders. The problem with taking the leaders is you have a real problem with assimilation, especially if the leaders become leaders in your, your culture or government. And that's exactly what happened to Babylonian. Anybody, the Babylonian Empire is still there, right? <laughs> the problem with the Babylonian Empire was eventually... The Israelites, they took their leaders, and they took their best people, and guess what happened to them? We know historically they became leaders in their own culture, and that, yeah, it's kind of the end of their culture. So, by this time, during that, especially during the Babylonian period, and during the inner period between the Assyrians and Babylonians, what happened to the temple? Yes. Was in disrepair. It wasn't totally destroyed, but was anybody making sacrifices there? No. So how did you promote your culture? How did you continue your culture? You did what? With the education. education. You invented the synagogue. The synagogue structure, depending on what rabbi you talk to, okay, there's a huge disparity in the rabbis. I uh, am kind of in agreement with the, the rabbis that say early. I think that the, they first started the synagogue stage with the defeat of the northern. When, when remember what happened? The northern southern kingdom separated, and in the north, they made up two places to sacrifice, and they had one place in Jerusalem. I think during that period is when the beginnings of the synagogue started. And some there, there's early synagogue theory and late synagogue theory, okay? I'm kind of in the mind that there's early synagogue theory, which means you started having the Pharisees, the Pharisaic groups, the rabbinic groups, pretty early in the in their thought. But whether it was early or late, yeah. <clears throat> Did they meet in secret? Were they secretly meeting in people's homes to keep it going, or were they out in the open? It depends. You know, I think that that's why I think it didn't happen. I think it happened very early. This is one of the arguments of why uh, early synagogue theory. Early synagogue theory says it started when everybody was pro or very positive toward Judaic thought, right? Because it, it's hard to get a toehold when everybody's against you, unless it's true. But the problem was that why would it suddenly exist in the Babylonian period if it didn't have a toehold before? And so the toll was, remember, what was their exhortation from the Old Testament? To, to write it on your forehead and your hand, which what they misinterpreted, right? God meant for them to put it into their brain, right? And, and do it with their hand. And they totally misinterpreted. But what is it, what do you have to do if you have to write it on your forehead? Literacy. Yeah, yeah. You have to learn to write, right? And you, if you're going to promote your the Old Testament documents, you have to have people, scribes, and you write. They always put the scribes and Pharisees together. Ah, what was that? So anyway, by the time this time, the Sanhedrin had 70 people in it. Four of them were Pharisees. 
But guess what the proportion of Pharisees to Sadducees was? Huge! There's a rabbi, okay, fiddling on the roof, right? There's a rabbi in every town, town village, place, right? Wherever there, by the way, remember, what do you got to have to have a synagogue? Two. No. You got to five. You got to have five men, right? Five males, five families to have a synagogue. So everywhere there's five families, you have a? And you're going to have a rabbi. And you'd like to have a? Torah scroll, right? At least a Torah scroll. But if you're in a bigger one, you're going to have all the Tanakh, right? You have all the scrolls of the Tanakh. So the Pharisees are the big time head of the whole thing. The Pharisees are the diaspora. The Pharisees are the guys. There's no Sadducees, there's no Sadducees out there in the diaspora. There's no temple. You have, you have a temple, right? There's no Sadducees in the diaspora. Not until the temple's destroyed in 125, I think. The Pharisees are the group. They're the ones. The Essenes, remember, split from the Sadducees and the Pharisees because... The high when, yeah, the, in, that's the Maccabean period. That's the 250 B.C. In 250 B.C., what happened was the Maccabees came into power, and the Maccabees, supposed Maccabus was a was a uh, Levite, but he wasn't of the he wasn't of, of uh, Aaronite. He didn't come from the Aaron from the priest. So therefore, he should not be a priest or high priest. But they declared his sons to be the high priest. And the last two were Jonathan and whatever. I haven't said myself. Thaddeus and Jonathan. Jonathan. And Jan anyway. They're all dead, right? They were all declared messiahs. They were all declared high priest and king, and they all croaked. So they were problem, problem, problematic messiahs. They had problematic messiahs from 250 BC because every single one of them was a messiah by, by the definition of the state. The Essenes took their ball and went, left, because they said, you're not following. And they had, they, they believe it was, I think it was Thaddeus or Jonathan, whatever, the name of the high priest at the time, they believe he went off with the Essenes, and so the Essenes started sacrificing I mean, a legal temple, right? And then there was the other temple, where? In Alexandria. Alexandria. And so the, there were Sadducees apparently in Alexandria from an early diaspora, and they were sacrificing illegally, but by this time, okay, so the Essenes are protesting the illegality of, of the non of the Pharisaic sacrifice, the incorrect sacrifice. But what were they doing? Sacrificing an illegal location. Bingo! So we got issues here, right? And so do you see how this causes an actual conglomeration eventually? We know where the Sadducees eventually went, right? Acts tells us. A whole bunch of the priests became in Hodos. The zealots, we believe, may have gone in Teen Hodos to a degree. And we know the Essenes, Jesus was probably an Essene. He sure followed Essenian practice a lot. Josephus was supposed to be an Essene. There's a lot of stuff in here, right? And the only guy's not for the Pharisees. And by the way, what do we have today? We have the Pharisees, we have the rabbis, and we have the hazy, crazy, and lazy. As they call themselves, I'm not being disparaging, they call themselves hazy, crazy, and lazy. That's the, the three, there are three groups of Pharisaic Jews today. The Reform, the Conser Orthodox, and, Orthodox. Con and what's, that, what's the third Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. Yeah, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. Hazy, crazy, and lazy is what they call themselves. That's like, you know, just like Lutherans call themselves what the... Um, the frozen chosen, yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> that's a little hist history thing. The biggest thing we got to get. Okay, this is it. Remember, almost everybody when they sacrificed were making food. They were cooking meat, meat, and so thumia, 
in Greek is the scent of the sacrifice, the smell of the sacrifice. So when you smell the meat cooking, just like when you go by Chester's Chop House and they're cooking the evening meal, and you go, oh, that smells so good, I want some of that, right? And they only got to eat it. If you were Hebrew, you ate it six times a year, unless you're wealthy. If you were Greek, you got it 12 times a year, because that's the festivals they had. So, Thumia is the sense of the sacrifice. Epithumia is very specific in being the sense of sacrifice. That's 11. In 12, we have macrothumia. Macro in Greek means length. This word means the length of the sacrifice, the scent of the sacrifice, going up to God, or to the gods, to be most specific in Greek. The problem with this word is, isn't that a beautiful, powerful kind of thought or idea? That, that you are participating in a sacrifice by eating the meat, right? But the scent of the sacrifice is going eternally up to God. That's what this implies. It is translated long-suffering and patience. Long-suffering and patience. Now that's better than epithumia, which is usually translated as lust. Lust. Do you see how powerful and important these words are? These are really critical words in Greek. The word, I, I can't give it a single definition other than the, the eternal line of the sacrifice, sent to the sacrifice from man to God. That's just a perfect, probably Greek cultural translation. Here's one we're all familiar with. Uh, pisteos. Piste, pistis. Pisteo. Pisteo, I just, this is in 12. It means to be persuaded. It is translated incorrectly as belief or faith. Okay? You know, for example, and I'm not going to get against any pastor, but you know, for example, we talk about losing your faith. We talk about people that don't have enough faith or people that don't ha feel content in their salvation. If it's true, how can you lose it? Right? In the Greek worldview, in the worldview of the New Testament, you're not believing in something that doesn't exist. You are convinced. You're convinced of something that exists. Right? If Christ died, well, Christ died on the cross. This is okay, historically provable, that Christ died on the cross and was resurrected. There are 500 people that saw it, according to the New Testament. 500 people. That's better than a jury, right? So how can you lose your faith about something that's true? I mean, I, I lose my faith all the time about Lincoln being president of the United States. And in Washington, I, I constantly have, have you know, thoughts that maybe Washington wasn't a president of the United States. You see what I'm saying? Right? We are misteaching people. Do you get this? The New Testament is all about being convinced of a truth, not of b faith, blindly believing in something that is, you know, wishes. True, wishes. I like you, the idea. Yeah, I like the idea, so I'm going to believe in it, right? I just say it. Of course, and that goes to our educational system, too. But anyway, okay, C L E R O N O M O. U-T-O-N. Okay, we should put a K in here, maybe make it easier. Claire, Claire O, Claire O no male. Claire O no male. And the reason why this is kind of cool is because, again, we can take it apart. No male means, no male is name, 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 no male, name. It's, it's, so the word itself means, okay, the base of nomos, um, to parcel out, it means uh, to parcel, but coming from the idea of a name of, like, for example, this means specifically to inherit or be an heir. And claro, claro, to break, to break, most specifically to break into parcels, to break it into parcels. So if you're inheriting... Let's say you're an inheritor, you're bringing in the parcels, and that's where we come to verse... Let me, let me hit 11, um, but I'm going to go directly to 12. We want... we Epithumio. We set our part upon literal the sin of the sacrifice, each of you to show, to indicate by word or act, the same diligence dispatch 
to the very end to carry out fully in evidence, in evidence, in order to make your hope, your elpish expectation, sure, that is, archi, until the terminus, the telos, until the telos. And then in 12, uh, hey, 12, we do not want, those are all added. Forget the do not want, drop it. It says, you, literally, hina me, so that not, so that not, two is added, so that not become lazy, literally become gilomai notros, become sluggish, but to meet, uh, mimetes, to imitate those who are clero nomeo, heirs by law, heirs by law, through persuasion, through pistis, not faith, through persuasion and macrothumia and macrothumia. So how do you imitate heirs by law? You are persuaded of what? If you're correctness. What's that? The legalness. Yeah, that you are God's child through Christ. That's right. See, it, you're not persuaded that Christ, okay, the, the thing is, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again, right? Christ is God, Christ has risen is a statement, of is a statement of fact. What are you having, what are you persuaded that that means? You're persuaded that that means that you are a child of God, that you are a hagios, right? You are a hagios, literally a, a, a deity. You are a demigod by, they call themselves hagios. We've been through this before. Hagios means literally a demigod. So you are persuaded that you are an inheritor. Now, you are persuaded of that because of two things. Because of your persuasion of that fact and then and macrothumia. Macrothumia is, there's multiple meanings in this. Remember, Greek is concrete. This is about as concrete as you can get. What is the number one macrothumia? The eternal line of the sense of the sacrifice. Whose? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sacrificed, right? This isn't a question. It is a fact. No, matter any historian that would disagree with you about Jesus Christ being um, put on a cross and executed by the Romans is an idiot. There is no way that you can persuasively prove that that did not happen from a historical standpoint. The fact that Jesus existed is well proven by other literature other than the New Testament. And I've even brought it to you and showed it to you. It's in, it's in the um, Hebrew um, uh, Talmud, Talmudic documents. I can pull it from the Talmudic documents. I can pull it from other uh, Jewish documents. I can pull it from Greek documents and Roman documents of the time. Soitness wrote about Christus during the time, although he wrote about Christus as a, uh, as a mysterion. There is no way that you cannot acknowledge that Jesus the Christ lived, was executed on a Roman cross. Now, the great thing that seems to be a stumbling block, that literally is a stumbling block to modern society, is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I got 500 people that said, I saw the risen Christ, okay? I mean, that's better than uh, Oprah, right? Just, you know, I'm just saying, you know, it was mass hysteria, right? Yeah, mass hysteria by multiple groups of people. Swamp gas. Swamp, yeah, it must have been swamp gas. I mean, if you go through evidence, to, I mean, there's a verdict, there's a whole bunch of books that talk about this. I mean, even the most elusive argument is becomes silly once you begin to study this, right? Unfortunately, they don't study it, but that's okay. So, Jesus Christ died and was... And according, and the big deal of persuasion, the persuasion part is this. What does it mean? What does it mean for Jesus Christ to be sacrificed? I mean, he could have been just some criminal, right? Some bad criminal dude that the Romans killed. And they killed a lot of them. They killed a lot of them. But why would it have any meaning, Right? The meaning, according to Hebrews, is that we are persuaded 
because basically of the macrothumia. Literally, we, this is the part where we would say, I am persuaded that the meaning for Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is specifically for my salvation. And it goes on. It says, it says, and macrothumia to kleronomeo, to be heirs by law, what has been epagelia, epagelia, okay? Epangelia, actually, epangelia. Now, they translate it as promise, as promise. What is epangelia? The word from the gods. The word from the gods. Yeah, not just the word from the gods. The word angelos, angel, comes from here, right? And I've told you before, yeah, you basically can look at this two ways. The way that it's looked at generally, for example, in most of the New Testament, as epi epigelia, is the word of the gods that comes from a person, right? But you can also look at it, this as a revelation from an angelic figure. Now, if, if you're a hagios and a demigod, what does that mean? Saints. No, it means it means that you, when you tell someone the gospel, you are doing what? You're pronouncing the word of God. You're pronouncing the word of God in an Evangelia because it's coming from a demigod. If you're an inheritor, if you are an inheritor, okay, it doesn't mean you are gods. I mean, let's not go to the that that's I think the problem. Well, that is the problem. The Aryan belief, right? The Aryans. You guys don't remember the Aryans? That's right. That's one of those things we should have been taught about when we were in. Um, Sunday school, but remember there's the Nicaeans and the Arians. We are <coughs> Nicaeans. Nicaeans in our view. The Arians believed that you literally became like God, and which is also Gnosticism, by the way. And that, that's the reason we rejected it, because we believe that we are inheritors of Christ's legacy, but we don't believe we are gods, right? Even though the New Testament talks a lot about it, now... You can take this one way or the other. If you're going to be a pure Greek, you would say, we are like God. We kind of be almost on the Aryan side. If you're going to be like English, right, or Romans, you would say, it's figurative. It's more of a figurative. That's why we had to invent a word like saint, right? Because saint implies Yeah, it gives us a special word, right? Because if we we're using the words from the Old Test or the New Testament, we would have called ourselves demigods, and you know that would be like, well, you can't do that, right? So, you know, I'm just saying. So, if you want to take it literally in the Greek versus figuratively in Latin thought, okay, okay. So anyway. Let's, uh, I have a quote. There's a quote from the Psalm of Solomon. This is an a apocryphal document. A Psalm, Psalms of Solomon 12.6. I may have put it in there. May the salvation of the Lord be upon Israel, his servant forever. May the wicked perish once and for all be, from before the Lord. And may the Lord's devout inherit the Lord's promises. And that's considered a direct analog to Hebrews 6.12. But... Let's go on. Let's go to 13. Now we're going to start getting into some very interesting stuff. Because he just set the stage for this logos, this logical argument. Uh, for some reason they threw off Gar. It says properly, properly, Evangelio, when God made, literally, properly, God made his promise, his Evangelio, to Abraham. Since, literally, since Epi, thereupon, thereupon, was no, uh, was no one, uh, that one is added, was no mesion larger for him to swear by, literally to kata down, to, to literally kata onomeo, to swear upon a name, to swear upon a name. And the reason I put over here our little... Uh, Okay, you know, I, I don't want to keep getting too much into the Egyptian stuff, but remember, I'm a thinking this is in Egypt. This is in Alexandria, which is a Greek protectorate. It's a Greek country, right? 
that at this time the Romans are, uh, Ro are the Romans in control? Yeah, Romans I think are in control. Greek protected, Romans are in control, right, past Caesar after about 60 BC. And the diaspora of the, of the Hebrews and the Teen Hodos are here. But remember, what, what is a Ren? The Ren is a name. Now, the biggest deal with this is, what was the first thing that happened to Abraham, or no, to Moses, when he went out of Egypt? What's well, about the first thing that happened we know of from the Bible? The Old Testament. When he was out there uh, taking care of his father-in-law's flocks, he saw a burning bush, right? And out of the burning bush, God, for the first time ever, told him his name. And he said, I am, basically Yahweh, the ultimate truth. Yahweh. I am. I am. Isn't it interesting that he gave his name after coming out of Egypt, where Egypt's leaving the Ren, Ka, Id, Ba, and Shut, where the Israelites believe in Adam and the Fesh. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and look in your Old Testament, because God did not put Ruch in man, he put Nefesh. And he put Nefesh in the animals too. Nefesh is the breath of life. So man, according to the Hebrews, is Adam, that is clay, dirt, and Nefesh. Not Ruch. Not Ruch. The Greeks, on the other hand, and you know this... I actually read a book the other day that actually had this in it, and I was so happy to see this, because I don't think you ever see this in a modern piece of literature. But the Greeks had Sarx, Suke, and Panuma, which we grossly translate as body, body, spirit, or this is intelligence, intellect, and Panuma is the Holy Ghost, or that's the, the soul. Soul. Body, spirit, and soul. I, you know, I don't think they discuss this stuff in our, in our schools anymore, right? I mean, in, in the schools in the past, this was a huge discussion. For example, the kids would learn a little bit about the Hebraic people, and they knew about Adam and Nefesh, and then their, in their Greek classes and their Latin classes, they would talk about Saksuki and Panuma. But isn't it interesting we get the addition of the name, Yahweh? So it says, and, and I'll translate, here's my translation. Properly God announced upon Abraham, thereupon no larger name to swear upon, he swore down upon his name. Not Abraham. Who swore on his name? God did. God swore upon his own name. This is really important because does Abraham mean anything in the world? No. What means something? If you believe that a name has power. And what do the, what do the Jewish people believe? How much power does this name have? They don't even say it. They, yeah, in Jose, according to Josephus, they never even said it. The, time, the only time the high priest said this name, and according to Josephus, by the time he said it in Christ's period, they had forgotten how to pronounce it by that time. The time they do it is in the end of Shakot at Rosh Hashanah when they blow, before they blow this stuff. What they do is they bring the, uh, the living water from the pool of Shiloh, from the pool of Shalom. They bring the living water in a bowl. They bring it up and they cleanse the altar. And during that period, just before they cleanse the altar, the high priest steps up and he does the 118th psalm. And in the 118th psalm it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. And they stop. 
and they wait for the Messiah to announce himself. According to John, what did Jesus Christ do at that point? He stood up and he said, I am, I am the living, I have living water for you, right? At that point, that's when the high priest is supposed to continue and they take the living water from the pool of Shalak and they dump it on the altar to cleanse it. It's cleansing of the altar. Jesus Christ stood up and said, I am the living water. Blasphemy. That, Killing. Well, it threw them in such disarray that the even the temple guards didn't would wouldn't do the you know wouldn't stop them didn't stop them the people were like this is when the Messiah is supposed to stand up now why do we miss that in our you know Edersheim writes about it I don't know if you read Edersheim Edersheim writes about this exact point Edersheim wrote back in the 1800s but you know I I never heard about it when I was a kid in Sunday school I'm like I had to dig this I had to pry this and dig this from Edersheim and from Josephus you know and I'm giving it to you. But this, and it's in my book, you know, in Centurion. But to me, this is like obvious stuff. Matter of fact, the most interesting thing about this, Josephus tells us, and I wish you, I don't know if they teach this even in the colleges, but Josephus writes that on one occasion, the priest missed the altar when he was supposed to pour it on. He missed the altar. <coughs> and pieces. the people got so irritated, they ripped him to pieces. They tore him apart. They ripped him apart. Because he had broken the continuation of what was supposed to be an eternal kind of thing. I don't know if they went back and got another bowl from the Polish a lot. He, oh, Josephus okay. doesn't tell us that. But, you know, if you, if, these, if you put all this together, I mean, that's the point. Putting all this together is so beautiful. Anyway, 14. It's not saying. It's Lego. Lego. Arguing. This is what God is saying. Arguing. I will surely, it's, it's literally, I'm men. If, it means yet if surely indeed. I will surely is what he translates. I'm men, yet if surely indeed. You Lego, not bless you, you Lego. What's you Lego? Lego is argument. You Lego, what's you? Good. Good argument, uh, a eulogy, right? Eulogy. Um, I will surely, literally, and yet I surely indeed speak well of, you lego, speak well of, and increasing, plethano, plethano, increase you, give you many descendants is added. The descendants part is added. God argues. He, said, he speaks well of him, basically gives him a, a, lot, a good argument, good argument, and I will increase you. Now, you can take that in lots of ways. If I were Greek, how would I take that? If I said I'm going to increase you, why would you immediately think that's descendants? Right? Planeo, plethano, thuno, plethuno, increasing. Plethuno, increase you. Plutono is the basis for the word of wealth, right? You hear that? Pluto, right? Pluto. So why descendants? But anyway, uh, the reason is because this is from Genesis 22, 17. In Genesis 22, 17, I won't read the whole thing to you. Let's see where it would be a good part. Uh, God's talking to Abraham. The, Lord, the angel in 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of the cities of their enemies. That's the quote they believe is a direct quote for this specific um, uh, quotation, right? But what do you think? I mean, it is it. It doesn't sound like a direct quote, does it? It's not. The Septuagint doesn't have this direct quote. I think. Is there another one in here? I don't think there's another quote in here. No. But anyway, let's. This. This is my translation of this. Arguing, and yet, if surely indeed, I I will speak well of you by speaking well by speaking well of you. This is a really interesting um, Greek. And yet, if 
Surely, indeed, I will speak well of you by speaking well of you and increase you by increasing you. It's a really interesting construction in Greek. I will increase you by increasing you. I will speak well of you by speaking well of you. This is really similar to the concept of the tithe, right? In the tithe, I celebrate what? I take... Yeah, yeah. God gave me. He increased me by increasing me, right? So this is really similar to this concept of a Thanksgiving sacrifice, by the way, which ties back exactly to the sacrifice of Christ. Because the meta-epithumia we're talking about, when we talk about epithumia and meta-epithumia about sacrifice, what is a remnant of the sacrifice that we have now? We have the Eucharist. We have the Eucharist. Remember, you, you can never forget this. In the Talmudic documents, the rabbi said that in the Messianic era, what would be the only sacrifice necessary? Thanksgiving. The Thanksgiving sacrifice. And guess what we do? The Thanksgiving sacrifice. Now, I kind of mad a little bit about John Christophanum. I'll have talk with him when I see him, but you know, he did leave us a great legacy because John Christophanum did not follow Paul. If we were truly Paulian, what would we be having during our Eucharist? We would be eating lamb, we'd be having a Seder, we'd be eating great food, you know, we'd probably be all fatter than we need to be, uh, than we already need to be, right? Feasting. But we, our Eucharist would have been a true Thanksgiving sacrifice. What he did, John Christophanum, even though he was Greek, was obviously doing what to the sacrifice? He made it into... He made it from concrete to, to euphemistic. He made it from concrete to figurative. And by the way, that isn't necessarily a bad thing because classical cultures, well, great literature, right? Go ahead. What are you saying? But didn't Jesus do that as well by breaking bread and wine? Mm. Breaking bread specifically. I don't think he did. Because remember, if we go back to the, I think if we look back to see what the Messianic Jewish view is, the Messianic view, Jews believe that when Jesus did it, remember, I got my Seder, and in my Seder, I take a glass of wine for who? It, it, Elijah? Yeah. Elijah. I take a glass of wine for Elijah and put it, because Elijah may come, right? Elijah had already come, right? He must come. And then I take, I take the... Um, Matzah, and I break it into three portions, right? I take one portion and I put it away, never to be seen. And I take another portion and I hide around the house for the kids to find. And then I use the third portion at the table. The Messianic Jews believe that Jesus took the third portion. The portion that was left for, well, the Messiah. The third portion was left for the Messiah. And he took the glass of wine for, his, for Elijah. In other words, Jesus Christ was concretely announcing what? That number one, well, most specifically, that number one, Elisha is already here, and number two, the Messiah is here, and who had, who's the only person who had the right to take the, the hidden matzah? Messiah. The Messiah. So, King David aside. This, this is big. Well, yeah, King David aside, because he did take the uh, showbread, showbread, right? The showbread. That, but taking the showbread. Not quite. Well, taking the showbread is a direct analogy, right? And you see what we do? I mean, I think this is lovely about our culture. This is perfect about our culture. Because when you read books, you, you don't want to read. Look, anyone who's read Greek poetry in the Greek will tell you, you know, the boy stood on the, on, the, uh, on the shifting deck or whatever. There's no illusion. There's no alliteration. It's just like boom, flat out, right? But in English poetry, French poetry, Italian poetry, is what? Adjectives, Adjectives and metaphors and, and, you know, just descriptive writing. And we got that from our Anglo-Saxons. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking the, the book of John, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. Yeah, the Passover. The Passover specific. The Passover, yes. He was born on the Passover, and he died on the Passover. And he was resurrected on the Passover. And perhaps he was baptized on the Passover. Perhaps. 
years. Perhaps. Who knows? But, you know. Give me three years, so, I mean, do the math. Don't we not need lamb because he is the lamb? So when we take his body and blood, we're receiving the lamb. Hey, that's what John Christophelum would have argued. Plus, look, you know, okay. We'd hardly ever have communion if we had lamb. I know. Let's throw this out. You know, really, you got to you got to put this out because this is absolutely true. Okay, we have plenty of bread. We have plenty of wine. Why did the church only have communion once a month? Sometimes some some churches only had it once a year. Yeah. Why? The Catholics also said you can only take the host, and that's sufficient for the whole communion because the wine was more expensive. That's right. And matter of fact, see, we, okay. Take off your prejudicial blinders, okay? The Catholic Church is not evil, and even Martin Luther still believed that he was following Catholic natural theology, and I agree 100% with his view, okay? But take off your blinder, because the Catholic Church, at a point, wanted more people to be able to do what? To take communion. So they specifically excluded the wine, so that more people could take communion. See? That is a positive, in my opinion. Yes, sir. One quick thing. I don't want to get bogged down. It's all right. But when we talk about the misunderstanding of the word peace is faith versus being convinced, are we also doing the, starting the same thing with sacrifice? I think sacrifice is doing it without something. That, that's not what that is at all. That is correct. And, and, I've, and if I have not mentioned that before, I'm remiss because I think we've talked about it a little bit. But thanks for bringing that up. That is absolutely true. The sacrifice in the ancient world was a communion with God, with the gods or with God. And even in the Hebrew, look, you know, what, what do we focus on, right? We focus on this stuff. It's like, what? What did they focus on? Just think, you're going to go take your tithe and you're going to eat meat. You know, and you've only you know you only get it like like six times a year. What are you thinking for, right? We have totally lost this concept, partially because we're too we're too fat. I'm sorry, we we are too fat a society. Not I'm not talking about our fatness. I'm talking about our we have too much. We have too much plenty, and we don't realize you know what that plenty really meant to the starvation cultures of the time. How important food is, right? Food is so critical. But anyway, thank you, Father, for your uh, word. We pray that you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen.